I want to give you a quick introduction. Shoe and Company is a um, consulting company with about 60 consultants, uh, only dealing with uh, complexity management. And the um, company was uh, founded in 1989. We've been in Atlanta in the US since 1997. And, um, we're happy to be here for the, for the first time. As I said, I want to make a little bit the connection between lean innovation and complexity management. And one thing that I have noticed is already that we are, when we're talking about um, a lot of the soft facts and uh, we are not the, the soft fact kind of company that talks about how to change people. We usually partner, we have partners to um, work with. When it comes to that, we are more the hard facts, make, make it count. <coughs> now, uh, the challenge is how do you move your company successfully into the future? And you may or may not agree with uh, the old Charles Darwin and his theory that he came up with, but for sure, for corporations, that is true. You have to be adaptable in order to survive and get into the future. So now, quick question to you. Um, what would you say if you look at this chart, which is bench, uh, uh, bench, based on a benchmarking that we have done with uh, 695 companies? And uh, does, does anybody want to venture out and uh, explain what's to be seen? when you look at the R&D budget of revenue, percentage of revenue, and the operative result. Yes, please. You would think that the biotech and pharmaceuticals, since they're spending so much of the budget on R&D, would have results that exceed the other industry groups. Okay. Really like you're not getting that. That's not mm -hmm. what you're going to Exactly. Did I just? There's no relationship. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sir. Yes, sir. Give the men a hand. That is exactly, that is exactly what we are showing in this picture. That the innovation, the, the amount of dollars spent on innovation are not related to any business success or failure. So with this having been said, what what is very important for us, we, we have heard about lean innovation yesterday in the innovation track. And um, in the innovation track, we have mostly talked about uh, the efficiencies. How do I become more efficient when I develop products, services? But that's only half the truth. What, what you need is you need to know what <coughs> do you develop and why do you develop this? And here, that's where complexity management comes in. And this is where we connect what we call a technology push with a market pull. You can't just only look at the market, but you can't only also neither just look at your engineering and say, you know what, we have very smart engineers in our organization. They'll develop something and then uh, we'll hand it over to sales and you know, they better sell it because um, you know, we need to have the revenue. Um, you need to understand that these things are all integrated all the way down through production. You want to develop products that are pleasing to the market but are also easily to be manufactured. And I think that connection is very crucial and very critical because I can do lean manufacturing for forever and never achieve the results that I can achieve by using this approach. So the approach is derived from the lean uh, manufacturing theory, from, from the lean enterprise theory. And it's a holistic approach, and I, we, we have four major um, items. We, we say, in the beginning, you need to prioritize, you structure, you synchronize, and then you adapt. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to go through all of these uh, items, but 
We have heard a lot about strategy. We've heard a lot about data and data consistency and how to manage data. We have heard a lot about uh, production. But what we have not heard about, or at least I have not heard about yet here on the tracks that I have followed, is product architecture. Yeah. How do I design products with a purpose to satisfy the market? And that's why I want to use the, the time today to just um, take a look at this and provide a generic approach to you for this. Question. How many or do you think in your company you have a complexity or multiple complexities or what is going on? Usually when we initially talk to our clients, they say, well, yeah, it's, it's complex. It's complex what we're doing. It's really complex. We have a merger. It's complex. We, we, we bring a new product that we launch, it's complex. One, there is a difference between complex and complicated. I'm not going to get into that. But we, we always um, make very sure that our clients understand that we have an external complexity, which is the complexity of the market, which is our product offering into the market. And we have our internal complexity, that's how we manufacture or provide our manufacture our products or provide our services. And somehow we need to make sure that these these both overlap with the least amount of waste. And that's what variant or complexity management is. How do you know? that you have a complexity problem in your company. Hmm. Work's getting too hard, maybe, I don't know. Very, very easy. If your company is growing and your revenues are growing and your profits aren't following anymore at the same rate that you would expect, then you have a complexity problem. So if you have a few products, you're not going to make much profit. And then you're going to grow your product portfolio, and the profits are growing, and everybody's happy. And at a certain point in time, you get past that maximum, and your revenues are going up, but your percentage of profit goes down. And that's a definite sign that you have a complexity challenge in your company that you're getting too complex, meaning you're doing too many things for the market that are not appreciated by the market. Why are they not appreciated by the market? Because your clients are not willing to pay for the features that you are providing, that you have designed into your products. Very important, uh, also a very important thing for, for engineers to think about. We sometimes um, say our clients do happy engineering. You have an engineering, and the engineers show whatever they can do. They change screws, they change this, they change that. Because, oh, we found one that's a little bit better here. We found something that's a little bit better there. And then in the end, um, we have production that says, oh my god, we have a whole shelving unit just with screws. And there are two millimeter, two and a half millimeter, three millimeter. Why do we do that? But there is no connection. Lean innovation will provide you that connection because we are going for a holistic approach. Now, how do you determine what you should develop? What your engineering um, department should work on? Yesterday we heard the 80-20 um, from Maria. That's a very good approach. Well, we take it a little bit further than that. We say, you know what? You take your cost of complexity and you take your benefits from your variance. And then you determine, do I have a low cost of complexity and a low benefit of variance? And benefit of variance usually can also be translated into being noticed by the customer. 
a customer sees what I've done here and is willing to pay for it. And we have in here seat heating. German car manufacturer developed a seat heating with eight different settings. <laughs> Quite frankly, if I get in the car in Germany in the winter, I want my behind to be warm. <laughs> right? I, do I need eight different settings? I don't need eight different settings. Therefore, this is a very, very weak, very small discriminator without any benefits or very low benefit. And that's why you want to keep the variance on these things low. You don't want to create a high variance because it's not appreciated by the customer in a form that they are willing to pay for it. If you would pick a car, you can pick with heated seat or without heated seat. But would you pay $200 extra to have one that has eight stages? I wouldn't. So now, um, I'm, mo I'm moving up. Low cost of complexity and high customer benefit. Now those are the things that you want to go for when you develop products. You want to develop those things where, there is, where, is, um, where you can create individuality because, you know, you might want to have a silver car and I want to have a black car and, you know, I don't know, Brian might want to have the green convertible. Uh, and um, so it's noticeable by the client. You see the things and you think about your products um, that, you, um, that you develop and that you provide to the market. What are the things that make them unique? What are the things that you can create variants in internally relatively easy, but for external purposes for the, for the product, you can create a large diversity that gives your clients the feeling of individuality. Those are the ones that you want to go for. And then you have the ones that have a high cost and a high benefit, but are usually not noticed by the client. So you don't want to mess with those. And then without saying um, all the things that have a high cost of complexity and a low customer benefit, you want to standardize. That's just where, this is where you're standardizing. Mm -hmm. So this is just a little quick overview of all the things where we find variants and about that those are actually from projects that we have uh, worked on. And, um, well, I already gave an example. There was another one, um, also German car in this case here. <laughs> Those are the lights that go between the driver and the co-pilot in the, in the ceiling. Yeah. Well, it, it's hard to already tell a difference in color here. But they were assembling and, and, uh, the, these lights in a yellow light, in a yellow, sur yellow lit surrounding, uh -huh. which was very, I don't know, common 10, 15 years ago. People couldn't tell the difference between these, and they, they put the wrong ones in the car. <coughs> Annoying for the client. If I would have only one, if I would have one color, wouldn't matter to me. But if the color looks horrible in my car, then it matters, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and so, so we've done a project with with these folks, and and here are project results. And I just picked this one. Uh, which is the one up here, reduction of the amount of interior lights. We took that down from 72 to, um, I think, 18. Um, and we, we could save our client $8 million right there. Mm -hmm. And I just want to do another little sidestep. If you recognize these things before you develop the product or during the development of the product, you are saving a whole bunch more. Why? Because then you don't buy the tooling, you don't buy the assembly equipment, and so on and so on. So mindful complexity management is a very, very powerful tool for cost saving. I'm just flipping through these. Um, it's basically the same story, just in different industries. Now, I want to touch on complexity cost. We, I, I've mentioned complexity cost before. Um, some of you that were up in the exhibition area may have seen that picture in the back of our booth. Mm -hmm. um, quick explanation to this. This is how complexity cost <coughs> works. If you have unmanaged complexity and your 
product portfolio is growing. That also means most of the time that you're selling a lot less of a standard product that you used to sell, mm. right? So now what happens is you have products that are specialty products. And of course, sales asks for a lot more money for these specialty products, right? One would hope. One would hope. But what do you think a case study has shown what the amount of money would be for like one-off products uh, in, a, in a consumer market if you would do that? Do you think it's double the cost to manufacture that? Yeah, no, maybe? I'll give you the answer, we don't have time. It's nine times the cost. You will never, nobody ever charges nine times. <laughs> Because you, you can't even, you can't sell it then. But that's the indicator. If you can't sell it for what it costs you, why would you even do it? If it doesn't make money, it doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> so, therefore, but what happens? Companies are still selling these products and they think we're doing great because they're looking at overhead costs. And when you look at overhead costs, you are cross-subsidizing these areas of your, um, oh my, are you? Cross-subsidizing. Yeah, exactly. I just want to make sure you are okay. <laughs> so so what, you, what, you're, um, what you're doing, you're cross-subsidizing, which may, means your standard products are becoming more expensive artificially you're not competitive anymore, and you're going to have a problem. So when we do a complexity cost analysis, this is a real, real life example. This is what the company thought they were doing with overhead costs. This is the outcome when you look at complexity cost or um, the, the activity-based accounting approach. So, and now we have developed a way of how you can create an overview and application cases in order to not having to do the uh, activity-based accounting <laughs> all the time, but what you do is you have to give uh, specific cases that you can use as a reference if the next time your engineer wants to use a different screw. All right, this is what I want to send you off with. If you want to achieve something you haven't achieved before, then you have to do something you haven't done before. Let this thing be complexity management and make your company successful. Thank you.